It's really good to be here. Um, and I do hope that there will be questions at the end. Um, yeah, the title I can see clearly now is really drawn from the situation we're in and this really weird combination of the familiar and the new. So even just, you know, taking a coffee break at the affiliated clubs conference, but, but you know, being in our own kitchen or wherever, wherever in the last few minutes, that, that juxtaposition of the, of the very, very familiar and the very different and new. Um, but also there are some unique possibilities that have come out of the, of the strange situation that we've been in. And I know that these are not sailing boats. Um, I don't have sailing credentials really, um, but I've got enough to know what a sailing boat looks like. And this is not uh, a picture of some sailing boats, but they're obviously gondolas. And uh, in Venice, uh, in back, way back, what feels like five years ago, but it was just the early part of this year when we in the UK were hearing stories about what was going on in Italy and wondering what might be coming towards us. One of the consequences of the early lockdown there was this uh, stopping of traffic, uh, not only on the roads, but uh, on the canals. And if you look on YouTube, and I'm sure some of you will have seen the reports at the time, what happened was with all the movement stopping, that the sediment and all the other stuff that, that was in the canals dropped to the bottom. And all of a sudden, Venetians who, when they were out and about, could see and there was you know apart from the rusty cans and the bottles and whatever there was wildlife there's a gorgeous picture of, uh, of a jellyfish swimming through through uh, the canals of venice so so i guess the metaphor which might be feeling a bit labored uh, nine months into this uh, or eight months for us into this pandemic experience is about the fact that we're moving more slowly and i think i've heard references to it in the previous sessions about the fact that everything's had to stop may provide the opportunity for new perspectives on how to pick things up. So I'm going to help, hope to help with that. As I say, if we can go to the next slide, I don't have great sailing credentials, but I do live in maritime Greenwich. If we were in a room together, I'd ask for a show of hands of who knows what, you know, if I'd been pre-1974, if I'd taken a photograph from exactly the same perspective, I'd still have seen uh, the entrance to the foot tunnel, which I was terrified of when I was a kid. My dad worked on the Isle of Dogs. Um, and I'd still have seen the Cutty Sark, but I'd have seen something else too. And, and I'll go to the next slide because it shows what was there, which was Gypsy Moth 4. Um, now, I guess one of the reasons I put that in is just to say that from a Greenwich residence point of view, you know, it was there one day and it wasn't there the next. And, and, and without being melodramatic about things, and once again, I've picked this up through the previous sessions, you know, the context uh, that we're in is, is, is one where things which have felt familiar and part of the landscape, and, and Gypsy Moth sat there from about 1968, which was uh, the year after Sir Francis Chichester completed that circumnavigation, uh, to uh, to about 2004, actually. I said, think I said 1974, 2004. So it was a fixture, and then it was gone. And you know, it's not overstating the, the case to to say that some people are facing existential threats right now in our businesses, but also in our clubs. And and we can't understate that. If we go to the next slide, and I'm giving you a bit of a kind of a day out in Greenwich. Um, it may not be existential, but it may feel precarious or that we're at the crossroads of some pretty important choices. This is Sir Henry Moore's figure on a knife edge. I'm slightly obsessed by it. It's, it I walk past it most days, particularly now, um, and often take photos of it in different lights. Um, and it, but, it, but it's actually also here today because it, it tells us another story figure on a knife edge also disappeared at the start of this century from Greenwich Park, from the, the little corner of Greenwich Park where it sits. And, and according to what I can find out, it, it was taken on a tour of the Midwestern states of, of the United States, a, along with some other pieces by Sir Henry Moore, the great sculptor. Um, and we wanted it back. Um, but we couldn't get it back because we were told that even for the Royal Parks and others involved, that the insurance and all the logistical and other issues associated with getting it back um, were made, just made it too hard. But the thing that made the difference was London 2012. And the organising committee 
I think partly as, as, as it's their efforts to build relationships with the community here in Greenwich who are going to have to, for some people, tolerate and for others massively enjoy having the global equestrian community descend on us. Um, they got us our sculpture back. And for me, that's one illustration, a small one, but a powerful one for me of, of the power of sport. And, and I think one of the themes that I just want to kind of like put to the forefront for you and your thinking uh, today is about the power of what you do. I love the stories and I'll come back to them that I've heard or the hints I've heard in previous sessions about the fact that lots of people <laughs> almost kind of got their noses pressed up against the, the locked gates of some of your clubs right now wanting to come through. I'm also going to draw, as Shirley has said, if we go to the next slide, on this book that I wrote, and I won't dwell on it, but one, you know, the catchphrase on the back of the book is don't just take decisions, make them. And one of the things that, 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 I, that I say in the book, and it's based on quite a few years of experience of being a fly on different people's walls as they've been making decisions, is that the end bit there is, is about taking a decision. It's about arriving at a decision, the now what bit, the conclusion, the action, this is what we're going to do. But most really good decisions have stuff which precedes that. They have the what bit, which is the opening out. What are the options? What's the data? What do we know? What might we discover? What do we want? Uh, the so what bit, which is where we connect things to each other, draw out the themes and the threads and the whatever, and arrive at the now what. And I think situating this what I'm saying for these next 15 minutes or so in this uh, conference today, we go to the next slide. You know, my understanding is that at the end of today's sessions, you'll talk about next steps. But before that, with the next slide, oh, it's disappeared. Oh, I can, oh no, I can see it now. I don't know if you can see it. I hope you, I, I, I can't see it on my main stage screen. But before the end session, You'll be in the process of, of sharing ideas. Oh, there it is. Um, and, before, and, and, and that's going to be the session after I've spoken. But what I hope I can do with the next slide is provoke some thoughts and, and, and give you some ideas in a way, just throw some at you and, and hope that some of them might stick and feel useful to you. So the first I want to share with you is about uh, a little teacher who I met, not in Greenwich actually, but up the hill in Blackheath, and he's in the next slide. And um, he reminded me of a, uh, a proverb, which I think um, the, the first recorded use of it is Archilochus, a, a Greek poet in the 6th century B BC. Isaiah Berlin uh, in the 20th century wrote an essay about it, basically around the theme that the, the hedgehog knows one big thing, but the fox knows many things. And my borrowing of this is to suggest that having a, you know, knowing one big thing, having a strategy um, is less helpful for a lot of the decisions that we have to make than being able to strategize. And thinking back to the previous slides, which are about, you know, this need in making a decision to, to, to open things out before we then play around with them and then close down on a decision, I mean, by the way, that's the process. I heard Ben Ainsley talking about the difference between decisions on the water and on land, where a decision on the water might have to happen in an instant. On dry land, you have more time. But, but I think that shape of decisions applies whether it's a decision that might take years or months to come to, um, or a decision even on the water, the skipper is, 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 is finding out what data's there, evaluating it, and then arriving at the decision. Um, but the, 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 the idea of the fox uh, as against the hedgehog is that the, the fox can thrive in different environments. The fox can adjust to all sorts of different things. The fox behaves differently on the edge of Blackheath than a fox would further out in the reaches of Kent or Sussex or, 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 or beyond in the countryside. Um, and I think part of what we need to do now is be, is, is be prepared to challenge our own thinking around things and be a bit more fox. So how can we do that? If we move to the next slide, I've got three um, approaches to strategizing that I just want to touch into with you. Bottom right, the first one I think would be familiar to anyone in a business context who's, who's gone through a kind of strategizing process 
um, the verb rather than the noun. It's, it's the geography bit, which is saying, well, okay, what's going on in our landscape? So the, the SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats may come into that. It's really important to be able to evaluate where the opportunities are, what's going on. And I think one of the challenges, and I've heard it referred to this morning in terms of the ROYA's response and its function in giving advice to you as clubs, is sometimes the, the, you know, the landscape is shifting on a daily basis. And sometimes, frankly, the people who need to be putting messages out about what's available, what's going to happen, and so on, they don't know either. And, and so the geographical bit in itself is quite difficult at the moment. But top right there, um, and I'm going to be really careful here because everyone on this uh, in this conference knows a lot more about navigation than I do. But, that, you know, on top right is the North Star and slightly to the left is Sirius, the Dog Star. So the, 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 the Pole Star is, or the North Star is about what is it that we're really trying to achieve? You know, where are we really trying to get to? And, and, you know, I don't want this to be a kind of COD MBA in five minutes, but we do know that the purpose or starting with why is something which has come to the fore. And I think it's really important once again to, to visit that. So from a club point of view, think about, well, why do we really exist? What's at the heart of what we want to achieve? Going back to the Venice uh, parallel and, and the clarity, maybe at this stage, several months into all the difficulties we've had and having had a few months where we just couldn't be in our club spaces together, maybe there's more clarity now about why it really matters that your club exists. I want to dwell for a minute on bottom left, which is the archaeology bit, because for me, um, often when I'm working with groups in or outside sport, what, what tends to happen a lot is that history kind of intervenes. And history, people sometimes when it comes up want to dismiss it uh, because they say, oh, it's not relevant. We're talking about the present and the future. But I think history is very important. But I don't just think of history as history. I like to divide it into two separate chunks. That if you like the helpful history, and the unhelpful history. And the unhelpful history is baggage, hence the suitcases there. And, 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 and if we can cut through or cut ourselves loose from that, it can be really useful. Or it can also be important to think about our heritage. So if we go to the next slide, which brings us back to Greenwich in terms of the picture, which I'll talk about in a minute, what we get is a situation where having thought about our North Star, where do we really wanna be? Having thought about the geography, you know, what's going on around us that's going to have an effect on us in terms of getting where we want to be, it can help to turn the gaze inwards and have an honest conversation about our club. You know, what is it that we've got in our locker, the heritage, which will fuel us on our way? And that might be assets, it might be people's, it, people, it might be volunteering, but it might be stuff that's in the past. It, it might go back to the foundation of the club, the reason why it was there in the first place. There will be lots of stuff that we can draw on and that if we can be true to it, it will help us on our way. And at the same time, there's likely to be baggage. You know, there's, there's likely to be stuff. There might be things that we've tried in the past and didn't work and we've kind of been bruised. There's in the collective memory, there's a kind of bruising around it and said, well, we don't want to go there. Well, maybe it's time to get over that and have another go and I'll come back to that point. You know, maybe there are other issues about how we operate or how we're perceived. And Sarah talked earlier about the perceptions of some of our clubs, which, which, which are going to hold us back if we don't address them. Some of you who've had a day out in Greenwich in the last few years will have seen um, uh, Yinka Shonibare MBE's uh, Ship in a Bottle, which was actually one of those fourth plinth sculptures in Trafalgar Square. I think it's a really interesting, um, well, it's interesting in, in all sorts of ways. Uh, I mean, it's, the, the ship is HMS Victory. Um, the sails are often associated rightly with West Africa because that's where you'll see those fabrics. Um, but actually, uh, they're Indonesian batik, uh, uh, manufactured in Dutch factories. So in, in a way, it's a, this, is, this is a sculpture about globalization. Um, but the other thing, or another thing, I mean, we could talk about this sculpture all day, and I, I love to, a, a bit, you know, it's, it's about 700 meters probably from the figure on the knife edge. They're so different from each other, but two sculptures which are just world class as far as I'm concerned, just up the road from me. Um, but the other thing about it is about HMS Victory. And someone asked the question uh, to Sarah about diversifying 
um, participation, particularly in sailing, and, part, and diversifying participation is something I'm really, really passionate about. It's really interesting, some of you will know this, but on HMS Victory, there are apparently there are about 600 people crew on at the Battle of, Battle of Trafalgar. Only about 450 categorized themselves as English. I'm not sure what their census methods were in those days. But the historians tell us that, you know, as well as the Irish and the Scots who were on there, there were two Indians, there was one African, and there were nine people from the Caribbean. And we know, and, and if you look at the bottom of the plinth on Trafalgar Square, you'll see a black sailor. We know that actually this was quite a diverse crew. Now, just a thought, I mean, I, I, one of my passions is about having a team GB and a Paralympics GB, which looks like and sounds like the whole nation. I reckon there were more black sailors on HMS Victory at Trafalgar than we've ever had representing us uh, on the international stage in sailing. Um, so that's just a thought. Can we move to the next slide, please? Yeah, so uh, affiliation. Um, this is the Affiliated Clubs uh, Conference. And you know, affiliation comes from a route which is to do with families. It's about adopting a son, but a, a family member into the family. And I think if we see the pictures, you know, families can be very pleasant places, and I'm sure many of your clubs are. And and but also, uh, left hand side, um, you know, they can be rather tense. And having been chief exec of a, of, a, of an Olympic and Paralympic legacy charity founded by Sir Keith Mills, actually former associate of uh, of Ben and great sailor, um, called Sported which has 3,000 members uh, UK-wide, including a number of sailing clubs using sport uh, or sailing for, uh, to, to educate and work with young people and in communities. Um, one of the things I've realized is that this can be a bit double-edged. I think that, you know, because, you know, when, when, when a young person says, oh, the club I'm a member of feels like my family, clearly it's a positive thing. When, when you're uh, noticing and experiencing the, uh, the, the, the shared sense of purpose and togetherness that, that, that happens in a good club, that's a great thing. But in, in some ways, one of the challenges I think for good clubs is that like a good family, they can feel from the edge or from the outside a bit like a closed system and hard to kind of get through that membrane. So uh, one of the things maybe that you'll be looking at and have the chance to reset post COVID is how do we operate as a club and do some of our strengths actually, some of our some of our heritage, going back to the previous point, um, yeah, they work for us, but but are there elements of that which maybe make other people feel excluded? I remember talking with the chief executive of a sport, not sailing, um, where it's very traditional for people in their club environments and in their competition environments to dress up in kind of blazers and 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 hats and all that sort of stuff. And um that can put some people off. The final point about family I wanted to make is uh, uh, Chief Rabbi Jonathan Sachs died uh, earlier this month and I was listening to an interview with him and he reminded me of, of another element of family which is in, in the Passover celebration or, or commemoration I should say um, in the Jewish communities and it is Saturday morning um, you know that that's something about remembering and celebrating uh, something which came along after the plagues in Egypt and, and, and the freeing of, of, of the Jewish people. But I think there's, a, there's an opportunity in that, which is about, and by the way, this is a religious ceremony which happens in the home. I'm really interested how you're going to mark the return, which, which we're all hoping and believing will happen in the new year. I'm wondering how you're going to let your family celebrate the fact that everyone's back together. And from a national point of view, how is sport more generally going to play a role in helping our country come out. Remember what we've learned through COVID because we've learned an immense amount about stuff, good and bad, that goes on in our communities, but also celebrate the fact that we can move on. So moving on to my final bit, I just want to flag up, and I, you know, I've said I'm passionate about inclusion. And here, here are three examples of clubs which are like families. Um, and which have a, to my mind, a very positive role that they're playing. And my question to you is, what role does your club play? Not necessarily around this issue, which is 
um, what I call, I call them positive deviants because these are, um, these are different. They're outside the norm, but, they, but, but they're, they're in a very positive way. So top left, that's Khadija Mella having won a race, uh, a charity race at Goodwood a couple of years ago. She's a member of the Ebony Horse Club in Brixton. Yeah, drop a, drop a horse club into the middle of Brixton and guess what? Some kids will look at it and say, that's not for me. Some kids will say, wow. And then they'll fall in love with horses, just like kids everywhere. Bottom left, Mossbourne Rowing Academy. Forgive me, this is a bit London-centric, but there are examples in other places. You know, a rowing academy in Hackney. Um, they decided to put rowing in as part of their curriculum because when they, when they, when they rebuilt the old Hackney Down School, because they thought it would give the kids, it would broaden their horizons, give them different opportunities. What they didn't expect was that in their first intake, they'd get a GB under 18 coming through from Hackney. Um, and I do think, and it's something that I, I talk about with the performance community, and I was lucky enough to be in Weymouth um, a few months ago with some of your coaches, your development coaches, just talking about group dynamics, is that, you know, look how well we do drawing off just a slice of our population. Imagine how brilliant we'd be in the Olympic and Paralympic arena if we drew from the whole population. Top right, some of you will be familiar with Project Scaramouche, um, Greg City Academy in Haringey. Um, I get told off because I, I said it was in Tottenham and someone, a local said, no, it's not specifically in Tottenham, but it is in Haringey. And, you know, because of one teacher, Mr. Holt, they set up their club um, within the school. And this was the first year that they did the fast knit, came 142nd out of 368 folks competing that year, 2017, but, and, and have carried on and, and actually are part of a, of, a, of a little group of projects that Sport England now are supporting as positive deviants um, because amongst other things, one of their alumni is now training to be an ocean racing skipper to follow in Ben's footsteps. I think, the, but the question here for you is not, are you gonna do these things, but how are you gonna be different? What is your North Star and where is it pointing you towards? And in answering that question, my final slide on this hat, I can see clearly now, one of the things uh, that I often do with groups is ask them to play Jenga, but a slightly different version from the, the one we play at home where you're trying to get the next person to knock it over. This is try and make it as tall as possible. And this goes back to strategizing big strategy. The people who come up with a strategy where the, where the task is to build a tower really tall, like, oh, we'll only take the bricks from the middle because that will make it really solid. They tend to run out of options very quickly. Um, also, the people who say, right, we're going to try and get as many bricks as we can, which means taking them from the edge, they also tend to have the tower fall over. The people who succeed tend to be the ones who at each turn feel it out and see what's possible. And the great thing about Jenga is that it can be a brick which doesn't want to move, but because you've moved another one, suddenly it becomes easy. Or there can be a brick you've had an eye on because you think you can move it, but when you get to it, it's locked. And if you try too hard, you'll pull your tower over. So I guess my question to you out of this, thinking about the, the next sessions is, what is it that you might have wanted to do as a club a year or two ago, or have had as an objective, which actually now has become impractical because of what's gone on through the last year. But conversely, what is it that you've, you've never thought you could do that out of this pandemic, you're thinking maybe now that's possible. So I have overrun, I haven't left much time for questions, but I will leave it there. And we've got at least a couple of minutes, Shirley, if there are any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. That was great. I think we've, we've all sat at those Christmas dinners, probably a bit of both of them. That made me laugh out loud. And the other thing I won't forget is, is to be a bit more of a fox. So I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to try my best. Uh, that really, really useful. And we have got a few questions, but we haven't got much time. So I'm going to I'm going to crack on. Um, Jude Banks asked, our club does not yet have a plan. Why do we need one, in your opinion? And where do we start? Starting is often the hardest thing, isn't it? For me, one of the main functions of a plan that works is that is to build understanding amongst the people who are going to have to do stuff. So it's not about a piece of paper which then goes into a drawer. So where do we start? Start in a circle, which might be a Zoom call, and start with a spacious conversation. Take the pressure off yourself by separating out those three bits. So don't make it all about arriving at a decision. Just have a chat and ask people what's important to them. Because if you get that buy-in early on, when it comes to executing, they'll do it. 
Good point. That's good, yeah. Uh, Sarah Allen asked, you touched on heritage or, or unconscious bias. As a committee, how can we overcome this? That's a big question <laughs> for a short answer. No, I, I think it's really important. I think one of the things I notice in sport, and it's not a malicious thing, is that people have preconceptions about who's going to be interested in their sport. And the examples I put up, I think, challenge that. Um, so I think, I mean, for me, there's nothing, one of my favorite songs, actually, it's not a great song, but it's very, it's a, the older people like me will remember, um, uh, let me take you by the hand and lead you through the streets of London. I'll show you something to make you change your mind. I think for me, having the conversation with the group who you're thinking about, finding a way, getting young people involved. I think one of the things that keeps me honest around my unconscious bias is my daughters, my 20 something daughters. So just making sure that the people who are in the conversation are bringing different perspectives. And, and if you let them have their say, they'll pretty quickly uncover some of those unconscious biases that you've got. Well, this question, and I do need a short answer, is from Jeremy Hurst, and it's kind of connected. He says, our club often decides against a new project as they tried it years ago and it failed. What would you say to those committee members? Okay, well, I mean, I I draw a line down the middle of, of a page and, I, I, and I'd say to those committee members, okay, what are all the reasons why it fa failed, right? And, and, and what's the fix? And I think the fact that it failed is probably good news because the experience of that, one of the, the final points in the book is that there are very few one-off decisions where you live or die by it. You always get another chance. So maybe introducing it as another chance to do something important is the way forward. Well, that's all we've got time for. It's been absolutely brilliant, Chris. Thanks. Thanks a million. Definitely going to finish the book now.